Hey guys, welcome. I'm Greg. In this video, we're gonna talk about impedance matching for transistors. Actually, we're gonna try to end with a misconception about impedance matching that I receive a lot of questions and comments on the videos every time. Why we need to impedance match a transistor to a source? Isn't the transistor a very high impedance load where impedance matching is not needed? And let's try to connect the behavior of impedance matching networks, as we already saw here, in videos on the channel to the problem of the excitation voltage that a transistor perceives when it's connected to a generator and you know better than me that this is real engineering because you're watching all electronics so every time i talk about impedance matching of a transistor people ask me and i have seen this kind of comments in other threads and forums on the internet why we need to impedance match a transistor if the impedance the input impedance of a transistor look into its base it's very high and people usually say that it is infinite the first thing that we need to comprehend is that the transistor is a voltage controlled current source and it's not because it has a fixed relation between current on the collector and current on the base that indeed it is a current controlled current source it is not the internal physics of the transistor modeled by the ever small equation that comes from the physical behavior of the materials it states that the current in the collector of the transistor is proportional to the excitation voltage between the base and the emitter that you call v b e and this is the current entering the collector of the transistor we can talk more about the model of a transistor in a following video but trust me the transistor is a voltage controlled current source so it becomes obvious to see that for maximizing the excitation on the input of the transistor we need to maximize the voltage between the base and the emitter the vbe voltage because of course maximizing the voltage swing on the transistor input we have the maximum current swing on the collector and we can ext extract the maximum power from the output of the transistor and of course this is valid for any configuration here i have drawn a common emitter amplifier and we are not showing the biasing and everything that's needed for this transistor to actually work let's follow all the arguments that we hear on the internet let's get a practical transistor like this one here and let's imagine that the input impedance at a given frequency is very is indeed very high let me put the transistor here let's imagine that this transistor has a one kilo ohm resistive impedance Forget about the capacitance, it doesn't matter for the example. At, let's say, one megahertz. So this device here, this active device, actually, when we look from this direction here, looks like a one kilo ohm resistor. Now that we have the equivalent input impedance here, we could erase the transistor and just think about the resistor. But I will keep the transistor here for the sake of the drawing here. And just a parenthesis this is a given transistor we cannot change the impedance of the transistor we got a device a physical device we put the device on a test chip we did put all the components around the transistor the biasing the output load and everything and we measured the input impedance at let's say one megahertz and this is the first step that leads to the misconception people think that you can engineer the load or engineer the source but this is far from common on rf on rf we usually have a given generator and a given amplifier a given filter a given transistor a given mixer that has an input impedance defined by its construction by its physics that cannot be changed the generator here is actually the output of a circuit that was before the transistor and its equivalent circuit is a voltage source of two volts rms an ideal voltage source in series with a 100 ohm resistor so we say that this has a 100 ohm output impedance and this also is given by the circuit you can imagine this is an amplifier that comes before this circuit here that this is the output of a ceramic filter that this is the output of a transducer it doesn't matter we measured this device here and the model comes out as a 2 volt rms voltage source and a 100 ohms series resistor what will be the base emitter voltage on this setup here let's calculate the output impedance of the source and the input impedance of the transistor configures a voltage divider that's just dividing the voltage of the source 
This is the voltage divider, and this is the input voltage of the voltage divider. This comes out to 1.81 volts, our MS. And a lot of people may be thinking that this is a very good configuration, because we are getting almost the full voltage swing available from the generator in the input of the transistor. By looking at this, people automatically conclude that this is a very good configuration, because we are almost getting all the voltage, the available voltage swing from the generator in the input of the transistor, modulating the base emitter. And this translates to a current modulation in the collector that can be extracted as output power with the following circuit. But here we have the second step that leads to the misconception. This is not the best configuration because what we are actually doing here is called voltage bridging. Voltage bridging makes that all the available voltage of the generator arrives at the input of the following circuit. And this seems to be the best solution because one can get confused about voltage and power. Voltage isn't power and we are not extracting the maximum power from the signal generator. And we are not delivering this maximum power to the input of the transistor. Let's understand this a little better. Let's calculate what is the maximum available power from this generator here. The available voltage, we know, that is 2 volts RMS. But what is the maximum available power? And remember, power is work. Power is really what is limited. Voltage and current are not limited. Power always can be represented as different ratios between voltage and current. You can represent the same amount of power with a very high voltage and low current, or with a very low voltage and high current. The maximum available power for this generator is the power transferred, the power available for a matched load. A matched load is a load that has the same impedance, the same resistive impedance of the output impedance of the generator. And let's forget about reactances, let's forget about the imaginary part because it doesn't change this argument. For a 2 volts RMS source with 100 ohm impedance that is connected to a matched load of 100 ohms, we're gonna have 1 volt RMS over the load, right? Because the voltage will be split equally. And the maximum available power in this case will be 1 volt square over 100 ohms. That is 1 over 110 milliwatts. This generator here can actually deliver a maximum of 10 milliwatts. And we can't change this because we cannot change the generator. This is the output of a mixer. This is the transistor that's here on the front. This is um, a filter. This may be an antenna. Of course, if we could change this, we would remove this resistor here. And we don't have any problem of impedance matching, right? If we could change the voltage or if we, we could change the resistance, we would just delete this resistor here and everything would be great. But we are limited by the physical devices, by the behaviors that we measure in the physical world. And what is the power that is being delivered here to this transistor in this configuration here? Remember that we had 1.81 volts RMS. The power at the base emitter, right, will be 1.81 squared over 100 ohms. That will be, I never got used it to this HP prime here, 3.3 milliwatts. 3.3. This is fascinating. We are not extracting the maximum power from the generator, from the circuit that is in front of the transistor, because this circuit here can deliver 10 milliwatts, and we are just extracting one third. If we are not extracting the maximum power, do you agree with me that the maximum voltage over this resistor here will always happen at the maximum power? Isn't the power on this resistance here, on the input of the transistor, isn't the power the voltage squared over the resistance? So the maximum excitation voltage of the base emitter will always happen when we maximize the power. And this is the third step for the misconception. When we don't work with RF, when we work with audio, when we work with low frequency signals, we never talk about power. We talk about signals right? We talk about information, we talk about sensors and things like that, about trying to maximize the voltage, the dynamic voltage range over an ADC, things like that. When we go to RF, 
we start to deal with power and we start to look at circuits from a different angle. It becomes clear that we can increase the voltage here in some way. In some way, we can increase the voltage because the universe is allowing us. We have 10 milliwatts of available power and we are just using 3.3. We're just using one third of the available work, of the available force that the generator can do. And this is exactly what an impedance matching network does. An impedance matching network is this circuit, is this middleman that we're gonna put here in the middle that will translate. You should look at my other videos about impedance matching because I talk more and more about this translation of voltage and current ratios. We need to get 10 milliwatts that will be coming out from this port here and we need to inject 10 milliwatts in this port here. This should be possible. We cannot inject more power than we extract because we would be breaking thermodynamics. But, but we need to transform the voltages and current profiles. The voltage current profile here will be different than in this port here. Here we're gonna have lower voltage and higher current. Here we're gonna have higher voltage and lower current. So let's go. Let's put here a middleman called the impedance matching network. So now we added a magical circuit here that's called the impedance matching network. Net work. I have a video explaining how impedance matching networks work. Link is in the description of this video. There I explain exactly how you can use capacitors and inductors and the Smith chart and everything to create and to design an impedance matching network. But what matters for this video here specifically is that, that we accept that this device here makes something magical. It separates between two different voltage and current profiles. It allows 10 milliwatts to enter this port as a voltage and current profile, as a 100 ohm voltage and current profile, and it outputs the same amount of power, the same amount of energy per second in a different voltage profile with higher voltage and lower current in a one kilo ohm impedance profile. What is the voltage now over the base emitter of the transistor? Let's back calculate. So the power at the base emitter is the voltage at the base emitter squared over the impedance of the base emitter, right? It's input impedance here. So the voltage, the excitation voltage, the square root of the power, 10 milliwatts, times the impedance, right? And this will be equal to the square root of 10, right? 3.16 volts are ms in this configuration here when we maximize the power delivered to the input of the transistor of course we also delivered the highest possible excitation voltage over the base emitter because the maximum excitation voltage will always happen when the maximum power is delivered to a given impedance and that's the case right here we have almost double the voltage swing over the base emitter junction of the transistor leading to almost double the current modulation on the collector of the transistor for a power matching setup and not for a voltage bridging setup so now this voltage here is 3.16 volts rms so yeah how this can be possible because you have more voltage than the generator voltage and this breaks many assumptions that people do because people always think that the transistor as it usually for lower frequencies have a very high input impedance people think of transistors as voltage sensors and that's not wrong usually we think about circuits that have very high impedances as voltage sensors because they swing with the voltage with the input voltage with consuming very little amount of power very very little current that's the definition of a voltage sensor right uh, an ideal voltage sensor has infinite input impedance but that doesn't mean that we are having the maximum possible excitation in the base of the transistor the maximum excitation happens for the power matched condition a new parenthesis guys for rf frequencies this impedance here is much lower okay not even one kilo ohm, 100, 50 ohms, 5 ohms for big transistors, 2 ohms for very big transistors. When we talk about RF, the transistors are not voltage sensors. Well, guys, I hope you liked this video. Please subscribe to the channel, give it a thumbs up and send to your friends. If you want to learn how the impedance matching networks are designed, how they can translate between voltage domains and current domains by different impedance profiles, I will leave here on the comment of the video two very important videos here from the channel. See you in the next video of Allotronics.
बाय बाय